Are you a woman in the middle? You're in the right place. I'm Susie Rosenstein, and you are listening to the Women in the Middle podcast, episode number 26. Imagine loving your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, so glad you're here for this week's episode, which is all about something that most of us deal with in some form or another. Plain and simple, it's the topic of confidence or lack thereof. I did an online interview about confidence and self-confidence in uh, business last week on Facebook, and it really got me thinking about the whole topic and why many of us don't have it or don't have enough of it. So that's what we'll take a look at today. What is confidence? Why many of us are in short supply and what you can do to get more of it, even at your age. Wouldn't it be great if you could just go to Costco and pick some up? Just pick up some confidence right next to that giant 12-pack of paper towels. Seriously, that would just be so fantastic. Anyway, before we go there, down the confidence aisle, I want to remind you of the amazing contest that I kicked off a few weeks ago in Podcast 21 about turning 50, and the contest is called 50 Unplugged. So many of my clients who are turning 50 tell me that they feel like something is off. They begin to feel like life is just passing them by and that they're frustrated and tired of feeling stagnant. And this is where the idea for the contest came from. The lead up to turning 50 can be really interesting. Lots of highs and lows. Well, maybe more lows (laughs) or at least some surprising thoughts that create some weird feelings. This is why I think it's the perfect time to think about how you want to leave your 40s And if you're turning 50 soon, do not miss this episode, uh, episode 21. And if you're turning 50 in 2018, welcome to the party. This contest is for you. You'll have a chance to win a guest spot on this podcast, some free coaching, and even my three-month signature one-on-one package. So just go to susierosenstein.com slash 50 unplugged contest. That's 550 unplugged contest to learn more. You can also find this link in the show notes. So make sure to share the contest with your friends who are turning 52. You know, let's do this, ladies. It is a good one. I love the questions I asked in the entry form. All right, let's get down to business. Confidence. I always like to start with a definition. So easy with the internet. (laughs) Here's the first one that popped up. Confidence is the feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something. Firm trust. It's the state of feeling certain about the truth of something. And also the feeling of self-assurance arising from one's own appreciation of one's own abilities or qualities. So what pops up here for you? I think you'll agree it's the part about being secure in yourself and your abilities. Think about it. Think about how different you are when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can trust yourself and your abilities, that you can really trust yourself to do exactly what you said you will do. If you make a plan, there's absolutely zero doubt that you will do what you said, that you will follow through on your plan. And you know what? You will even follow through when you don't feel like it. (laughs) Does this sound like you? This is completely different than when you say you'll do something and then shift into this feeling of hoping it will happen. For example, let's compare two things to really drive this point home. Let's say that it's Sunday night and you're planning your week and you decide that you're going to the gym on Wednesday at four. You even put it in your calendar and you're feeling so pleased with yourself that it's written down. Your kid is also flying home for the holidays and you tell him that you'll pick him up at the airport at 6 p.m. on Thursday night and you are super excited to see him. You haven't seen him in a couple of months. Now, be honest with yourself. Do you have the same level of confidence about each of your commitments? The first commitment to go to the gym is a commitment to yourself. The second commitment to pick up your kid at the airport is a commitment to someone else. 
Can you trust yourself to follow through on each of these commitments? Or can you pretty much guarantee that you'll pick up your kid, but you're not so sure you'll be at the gym the day before at four o'clock? This example shows you that your confidence in your ability to follow through on your commitment to yourself might be a little different. Interesting, right? I'm sure you think of yourself as a woman in the middle who keeps her word. But as you can see, not all commitments create the same feelings. This gym example leaves room for self-doubt for many people. It's actually the opposite of self-confidence because think about it. If you can't count on yourself, you can definitely feel insecure. It's different than being in charge, or as we say in my family, margin charge. <laughs> You're margin charge when it comes to picking your kid up at the airport though, right? I don't know who Marge is, by the way, or why we happen to say it in my family, but I think you get the point. You don't have the same feeling of being in control. It's an example of feeling like you're at the effect of yourself rather than having complete control and self-confidence. So why might you trust yourself versus not trusting yourself? It comes from consistently following through on your word to yourself. This brings something else to mind for me. It's the way I view people who have the skill. People who have the practiced skill of following through on their word to themselves. I bet you're thinking of a few people like this too. These are the people that actually say no to things because they have an appointment with themselves. I've noticed that I have a bit of a negative attitude about these people, many of whom are my dear friends. <laughs> I love them, of course, but I'm quite aware of this judgmental thought that pops into my brain every now and again. And of course, it's about me, not them. I find myself thinking it's just a bit over the top to be that rigid and inflexible. That's my thought. That following through on your word to yourself is a little too much. Some people might call it extra. It's a little extra. <laughs> and I don't know. I have to just say, ew, ew, that's not nice. But basically, that's what the thought under the other thought is in my brain sometimes. And I can see how that thought has played a significant role in my life. Personally, I have an easy time following through on professional commitments, but I definitely think differently about personal commitments to myself. My level of self-confidence just isn't the same. Now, I want to point out something else, too. I really don't think you're born with self-confidence. It it just might be something you earn as a result of doing what you say you're going to do, like a muscle or a skill that gets stronger with repeated effort. So ask yourself, what do you think of yourself that affects your self-confidence? Remember, all of our feelings are created by our thoughts and confidence is a feeling. Self-confidence is a feeling about the self. So following that idea along, you can see that the way you think about yourself is actually determined if you feel confident or not. How does a self-confident person typically feel, you might be wondering? Probably competent, capable, worthy, things like that. And notice that you don't have to prove any of this stuff. These are feelings that come from thoughts. Nobody is evaluating your performance. And, and like assessing whether or not you deserve to feel worthy or capable. It's coming from your own thinking. And the beautiful thing is that you can feel these things without doing anything perfectly. You don't need to uh, be really focused on perfection. When you nail down the thought work, these feelings are available to you. But all of this talk begs the question about why so many of us don't have gobs and gobs of self-confidence. And as most of you women in the middle out there are listening know, most of us have no clue how to manage our minds. <laughs> we just bumble about in a chaotic blur of life-related activity, behaving at the effect of our feelings unintentionally. We don't understand how to manage our minds, so we feel out of control when it comes to our feelings and our actions. We react quickly without reflecting on what we really want to feel or do. We're just out there letting ourselves down, basically. And all of this kind of thing is counterproductive to the intentional living that you want to be doing. That's the point of mindfulness. 
it's pretty hard to just trust yourself when you're just out there not being your best self. The other thing is that most of us are afraid of negative emotions, super scary stuff. We just don't want to feel anything icky or unpleasant. So we hide from this stuff to avoid it, to avoid emotions. That's when we do all kinds of other stuff instead, like we overeat, we overdrink, we overspend, we over surf online, we over Facebook and so on, that kind of thing. It's so common for you amazing women out there, you older and wiser, beautiful creatures. It's so common to be so unbelievably brutal when it comes to not thinking highly of yourself. You know exactly what I mean. It's like you go on a hunt to find something that's wrong or not perfect. It's so much easier to spend time doing this which will create negative emotions versus spending time thinking thoughts that create positive emotions. You know, thoughts about how wonderful you are. (laughs) Things that make you feel feelings like I mentioned, that you're capable and awesome. This kind of thinking doesn't increase self-confidence at all. No surprise. And as I mentioned, thinking thoughts that actually create confidence is a skill. It's a weak skill for most of you guys. It's so good to think of it like this because I know that you know that you have definitely practiced skills and gotten better at them, right? You have. You have lots of examples of how when you practice something, you get better at it. Piano, golf, push-ups, tennis, anything, right? Philosophically, you shouldn't have too much difficulty accepting this concept. Believing the thoughts that create confidence is the other part of it, though, and that is usually more of a stretch. Most of our beliefs are just recycled crap from childhood. What usually happens is that you have no clue how often you key into these beliefs and how much self-doubt they create. And don't even get me started on anxiety. But here's the best news ever. Just because you've had these beliefs for a few decades or so, it doesn't mean that you have to keep them around for a few more. Just because you're comfortable thinking this way doesn't mean you need to continue with this old familiar thought or this type of thinking. And I think you would agree that you have to toss out your most comfortable slippers when they cross that line into stinky and gross, even though they're familiar and old crappy thoughts are like that. And I have to say that I'm saying this to you as I'm wearing my old slippers that Nico, my dog, got a hold of recently. (laughs) It might be time for them to go. Here are a few examples of stinky thoughts that might be comfortably taking up your brain real estate right now. I don't know how. Confident people are smarter than I am. They're different. It's easier for them. I'm a victim and damaged because of that bad shit that happened to me. Confidence is something you either have or don't have. Wow, right? Did you invite those thoughts into your brain? I doubt it. I think not. Who knows how they got there? And you know what? It does. I don't even care. It doesn't even matter. I really don't even think it's that important. But what is super important is that you see them there. You notice that they are only thoughts. They're optional. They're sentences in your mind. You don't need to be at the effect of them unintentionally. Really, let that sink in. They're just thoughts, not facts. And it's time to take out the recycling. Right? Speaking of recycling, (laughs) I want to share something with you about one of my sons and his experience with his unicycle play on the word cycle, recycle, unicycle, that that was my bridge to get us here. (laughs) Anyway, this experience with the unicycle that I want to tell you about illustrates the power of your beliefs beautifully. So about nine or 10 years ago, he got it into his head that he wanted to learn how to ride a unicycle. My husband did a bit of research and found a unicycle club in downtown Toronto. So the next thing I knew, my hubby purchased two unicycles, one for my son and an extra one for the family, my other two sons and the two of us. And away we went. Now, this unicycle club practiced in a church gym way downtown. And when the five of us got there, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. (laughs) There must have been 
20 or 30 people riding around on these things and not just riding. They were playing basketball, unicycle basketball, if you can even imagine what that would look like, dribbling, shooting, all of it. I was in a bit of a shock. It was way more than I expected. It all seemed so impossible. Anyway, someone came over to help us, introduced us to the wall and the side of the stage to hold on to for support and offered us the basic instructions for how to ride a unicycle. He explained how to hold the pedals so it's easier to hop up and also to expect it to take about 10 hours or so, plus or minus a teeny bit of solid practice to learn to ride. Now, we all heard this, all five of us, but only one of us believed what he heard. So the following week, my son set up the recycling container. Nice, right? Another recycling reference. You know, the big giant blue one, big giant container in the street to use to steady himself as he started to practice. He would put one hand on the top of the recycling bin and, you know, practice balance and slowly but surely riding around the bin in the street. The others of us family members went out to join him here or there with our own feeble practice attempts, but nothing consistent. He was out there, though, like clockwork, like it was a job. Now, there was something very different about how we each processed what we heard about how long it takes to learn to ride a unicycle. And guess what? My kid learned to ride the unicycle in exactly 10 hours. No other family members are able to ride the unicycle to this day. It is just so interesting. When I asked him about it, he explained that there wasn't a shadow of a doubt that he would learn to ride the unicycle in that amount of time. He believed he would have complete success. Now, remember, we were all standing there at the same time. We all heard the information come out of that guy's mouth about exactly what to expect from practicing the unicycle. But we did not make it mean what my son made it mean. He felt completely differently about the whole learning to ride a unicycle thing. I had self-doubt. He had complete confidence. My thought was, some people can learn to ride in 10 hours, but probably not me. My son's thought was so different than mine. He thought, I'm going to learn to ride the unicycle within 10 hours, 10 hours of practice. Boom. His thoughts created his feelings of confidence, which fueled his actions or his behavior of focus and practice. And there it was, a successful result, which, of course, proved his thought. He took massive action. He hopped up. He fell off. He hopped up. He fell off for hours, 10 to be exact. Such a beautiful example. I loved watching him create that result for himself. It was really something. So another example of this sort of thing popped into my mind as I was prepping this podcast episode. So let's go way back to 1989. I was defending my master's thesis for my applied social psychology degree from the University of Guelph. The topic of my thesis was the relationship between children and their pet dogs, and it was a qualitative study. I had interviewed dozens of children about the relationship with their pet dogs. I had tons of information. It was it was awesome, really. <laughs> I really loved my thesis topic. Anyway, I didn't know exactly what to expect from a thesis defense other than I knew there would be a classroom full of other master's students and professors from my department. Of course, I was nervous. So how old was I then? I was in my early 20s. I remember being worried that a professor would ask me a question that I couldn't answer and that I would feel embarrassed or perhaps even humiliated, right? I can remember looking out at the room of people. It was packed and I assessed the situation, assessed the crowd. You know, did they love me? Were they going to be kind? (laughs) Who was going to ask the question that was going to freak me out? I wasn't sure what to expect. And then I began. And as I fielded and answered the questions, I remember a new thought coming into my awareness about halfway through. It really was like a thought bubble above my head. And I know I talked to you guys about these thought bubbles and the ability to create that distance to become a watcher of your thoughts 
that you're not your thoughts, right? So I didn't know anything about life coaching or mindfulness back then, but I do distinctly remember having a, an awareness of a thought that was popping in. The thought was, I know much more about this data than anyone else in the room. It never occurred to me before that moment. And can you imagine how that thought made me feel? Self-confident. I completely trusted myself and my work in that moment. I didn't understand that it was my thinking creating that hole of self-doubt. I didn't understand that before, but now with that thought, that self-doubt was gone. The only thing that changed in that moment was my thinking. My research was the same, right? I'd still interviewed all those people. The printed copy of my thesis was the same. I was still standing up there. The only thing that changed was my thinking, my beliefs, not the facts, not the circumstance. That was exactly the same. I actually felt that self-doubt just melt away. I felt lifted, like it melted away and I just felt lifted up. My new thought did not feed the self-doubt. It had no business occupying my body anymore. <laughs> I wonder how many other times I entertained a thought like that, though. I wonder how many times you entertain a thought like that. Your brain doesn't produce self-confidence. As you can see from these examples, it's your thinking and beliefs that produce it. Your brain has lots more practice producing thoughts that create fear and worry and doubt. So my lovely women in the middle, I believe we have some work to do. It's time to take on a new challenge. And if you're doing a vision board, you may want to consider adding this to your priorities. How can you increase self-confidence? How can you change your thoughts about yourself? What thought or belief are you ready to say goodbye to? I want you to really, really, really think about how you can practice being more certain of what you want to create in your life. Emphasis on the word certain. The more certain you are of even the possibility that you can be more intentional like this, the more confidence you will experience as you move forward. Consider this too. You don't have to change your identity to be a more confident person. You just need to work on the way you think. Confidence is a feeling. You create this feeling by your thinking. It's not fixed. Wow, right? Think about that. Confidence is a feeling. Feelings come from your thinking. So it's your actions that increase your capability. That makes sense, right? It's your capability that increases your confidence. I learned that at the Life Coach School. There was a wonderful um, lesson. I think it was in the spring where we were really talking about this and this point was just drilled in. It's your actions that increase your capability and it's your capability that increases your confidence. So moving forward, increases your confidence, your self-confidence, because you get more practice. More practice creates more capability. It makes perfect sense. And this is another reason why massive action is so important. So many of you quit too soon when not nearly enough action has been taken. So you have to push yourself to really think about some of your beliefs that don't serve you at all. Try some more useful thoughts on for size. Thoughts like these. I'm a woman who has her own back. Practicing failure is good for me. <laughs> good one, right? I was made to do this. My potential is huge. And how about this one? Let them be wrong about me. Whoa. <laughs> Can you imagine that one? I think most of us need a little work on that. Most of us worry way too much. Worry is one of those emotions that feels so necessary. It feels like it has to be there. But worry, just like every other emotion, is created by a thought. You don't have to be worried as much as you think you do. 
How much self-confidence would you have if you honored your decisions and really believed that your self-confidence came from you needing your own approval rather than someone else's, right? Yikes. (laughs) All right. There you have it. Lots of things to think about when it comes to you living more intentionally and becoming a woman who smiles and speaks up and stands tall and has her own back. Look out, world. It's time for you to be more of who you know you can be. It's time to step out, right? So that's it for this episode. Remember, if you or someone you know is turning 50 in 2018, I really do want you to check out the 50 Unplugged Contest at suzyrosenstein.com slash 50 Unplugged Contest and enter. It's a great way to kick off this amazing year. Okay, ladies, let's do this. Let's do this together. One thought at a time. We're here for each other, right? Thanks for listening. Okay.